thank you. Um, wow, what an honor. Thank you for that, Julian. I appreciate it. What an honor. This is my first. I've been to Cambridge before, but this is my first time speaking here uh, at any part of Cambridge. Um, and so invoking Malthus and, and Coleridge is not at all intimidating. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, but it's, it's a real honor to be here. And, uh, and this is really kind of day one of my book tour for the UK version of, uh, of Farsighted. So I'm, I'm just launching into it here. Um, this is, as Julian said, this is this is my eleventh book, um, and they've been my, my books have been on a whole range of different topics. I wrote a book about cholera in London in the 1850s. I wrote a book about Joseph Priestley, which I'm going to mention a little bit later. Um, a number of them have shared this theme of of innovation and and where good ideas come from. Looking back at the history of ideas and technologies and ideas in the sciences, trying to explain the kind of chemistry of, of places or organizations or of, of, of people that, that are able to have unusually creative insights in, in multiple fields. Um, this book builds on some of that work. And as you'll see, I, I'm going to try and tie together a little bit of the innovation work, because in part because we're here in the intellectual forum, uh, where that's an important uh, kind of concept. Um, but it actually looks at a slightly different theme, which is this idea of complex decision making and, and long-term decision making. Uh, and I thought it would be interesting to just tell you first how I got involved uh, in this project um, and then walk through some of the arguments and some of the strategies that the book talks about. And then we can open it up for questions. Um, one of the things I learned <laughs> when the book first came out and I was on book tour in the U US, I would do radio shows and I would talk about all these arguments in the book. And then people would call in and, and their questions would be like, uh, my wife and I are trying to decide whether to have a second child, should I? <laughs> <laughs> and I realized that I was becoming like an advice columnist or something, which I didn't realize I was going to be. So if you have questions like that, uh, you might refrain from doing it, because I'm not sure if I could give you helpful answers. Um, but this book actually has roots that date back uh, almost n nine years. This, this book has the longest incubation period of, of any of my books, which is maybe appropriate for a book about long-term thinking. Um, I had just finished writing this book, Where Good Ideas Come From. And that book looked at the patterns of unusually innovative people and networks and, and, and places. And one of the key kind of recurring themes in that book was uh, a story about Darwin and his notebooks, um, particularly his notebooks from the late 1830s. Um, and those notebooks are, are a fascinating kind of case study in a mind stumbling its way towards maybe the most important scientific idea of the 19th century. Um, and it's interesting. It was interesting in the, in the context of where good ideas come from, because Darwin kind of told the story of his discovery of the theory of natural selection as a, as a kind of flash of insight or a light bulb moment when suddenly it became clear to him uh, the, the theory of natural selection, inspired, interestingly, by reading Malthus. Um, so it's known as the Malthusian epiphany. Um, but when you go back and look at his notebooks, it turns out that he actually was working on the idea in a recognizable way for, for six or seven months before he actually has this alleged epiphany. And he continues to kind of toy with it for another six months before he really has a fully kind of drawn out theory. And so in that book, I was trying to show that light bulb moments are actually kind of overrated. And, and what normally happens in, in big ideas is we have something I call a slow hunch, where it's a much slower, more evolutionary process. So I'd spent a lot of time with Darwin's journals from this period in the 1830s. Um, by the way, they are, I believe, in the archives here in Cambridge. Um, so it's another reason to talk about this. Um, but I knew from that research that there is a very somewhat amusing, sweet, um, slightly nerdy uh, section of those notebooks where in the middle of trying to wrestle with this mammoth idea that's going to change the the, the world in, in a very real sense in multiple ways, uh, he pauses and has this two-page spread uh, in, the, in, in his journal in between all these scientific ruminations where he, does, he, he creates a, a basically what we would now consider a pros and cons list, debating not the nature of, uh, of human and, and, and global biological evolution, but rather the question of whether he should get married. <laughs> And he, he, he really creates a, a pros and cons list. He creates one side, I'm sure you can't read this, but one side says marry and the other side says not marry. 
And he goes through a list of kind of attributes of things that he likes about you know, both and doesn't like about both options. And he's at the stage where he, he's trying to decide whether he should marry Emma Wedgwood, who he ends up marrying, his, who was his first cousin, we should point out. Someone uh, remarked to me when I was talking about this that it was interesting on this list, uh, uh, on, on the side of not marry, um, he does not include the line, she's my cousin. <laughs> Which presumably would have today been a bit more of a concern. So the list has, uh, it has aged a little bit. It's a little dated in some ways. Um, and it's quite funny. Uh, I'll just read, the whole thing is reproduced in the book. Um, or I suppose you could go to the library here and find it. But uh, I'll just read you a couple of them. On the side of Not Mary, he has um, freedom to go where one liked, uh, choice of society and little of it. Um, my favorite one. Conversation of clever men in clubs. That's what he's afraid <laughs> he's going to give up if he, uh, if he gets married. Um, the, on the side of Mary, there are some that may be somewhat predictable. Children, he says, in quotes, if it please God, which is interesting because of course he became agnostic. Um, I can barely read this because I need my glasses. But uh, constant companion uh, and friend in old age who will feel interested in one. Um, and then this one, object to be beloved and played with better than a dog, anyhow. <laughs> so those were different times. Perhaps we, the language is not so appropriate now. But um, that was his list. And, and he eventually did decide to um, get married and, and had, did have a very uh, happy marriage in many ways. So, so he came out on the side of marrying there. Um, but what I found so striking about this is that the pros and cons list is, for most of us, like the one technique that we learn for making important decisions in our lives, right? Like, I remember my dad teaching me how to do it on a yellow legal pad when I was 10 or something. You know, you write up your list and you figure out which, which one is longer, and then that's how you make your decision. And the pros and cons list actually turns out to date back um, to Joseph Priestley, the, the, the brilliant British chemist and political radical who was a hero of my book, The Invention of Air, um, who in the 1770s was weighing this momentous decision in his life about whether to kind of change careers and take on a new patron and move um, from one part of England to the other. And he wrote to his good friend, Benjamin Franklin. And Franklin wrote back and said, listen, I can't tell you Priestley had written for advice on this decision. What should I do, Ben? And Franklin wrote back and said, listen, I can't tell you what to do, but I can tell you this method I have. And he basically describes creating a pros and cons list. Franklin calls it moral algebra, um, and or prudential algebra. He has these two names for it. And so what I found so striking in thinking about this is here's the one technique that most of us have learned um, in our lives for making complex choices. And it really fundamentally hasn't changed in more than 200 years. In fact, if you look at Franklin's advice to Priestley, he actually has a couple of techniques involving weighting the different um, values that you're, that you're deciding around. Um, some are more important than others. And so he has a technique for kind of suggesting that this one is more important than others, which is not normally included in a normal pros and cons list. So in a sense, the technique has actually gone backwards. It's less nuanced than it was in the 1770s when Franklin was talking to Priestley about it. And so it occurred to me that surely there were other tools out there that should be in wider circulation. And at that point, there had been, when I was first thinking about this in 2011, 2012, there had been a number of books about how we decide. There was actually a book called How We Decide. Um, there was Blink by Malcolm Gladwell. Um, uh, shortly after this, there was Thinking Fast and Slow with its discussion of the System 1 brain and the System 2 brain. But almost all those books had really been focused on the System 1 brain, the instinctive decision, the gut decisions, decisions we make in, a, in an instant, and the ways in which we can do that with, with some success and with some surprising efficacy, and also the ways in which those kinds of gut decisions sometimes fail us. And it occurred to me, as fascinating as that research was, and how much I uh, you know, enjoyed reading those books, that the decisions that we ultimately look back on as the ones that really define our personal lives, our professional lives, our civic lives, are not decisions that should be made in an instant, are not decisions that should just be system one choices. They're decisions that require time and deliberation and consultation with other people and collaborative networks to help us make these decisions. And so I started to think, well, maybe there's a, there's a book to be written about that. And I personally 
was was also inspired to write this because I was in the middle of my my version of a midlife crisis. I won't get too personal, I promise. Um, but I had decided after 20 years of living in New York City that I had to spend some point in my life living on the west coast of the United States and became obsessed with this idea that our family should move. I had three young kids and my wife. Uh, and it was time for us to move to California for a stretch of time. And my wife was not at all down with this program at all. And it became this very complicated choice um, in our marriage and uh, in, in our family. And I thought, well, surely there, there, there are better tools out there for making a, a complex choice like this. And one of the things that I realized as I thought about it, and the more I kind of dug around into the literature, is that one of the things that defines these kinds of choices and makes them so difficult is they're what I call in the book uh, a full spectrum decision. Um, that there are some choices that just involve one kind of slice of your life. If you're trying to decide what kind of ice cream to have for dinner, it's basically for dessert, it's basically you know you, your taste buds, you know what you're in the mood for. Um, when you're trying to decide, should I move from one part of the country to another? Should I move from the city to the suburbs, say? Um, just think of the range of values and attributes of the kind of scales of human experience that are implicated in a choice like that, right? You're thinking about how important are your existing friends in this community versus some unknown new place where you're moving to? How important are, are, is it to be in a dense urban area that's sidewalk-based versus a car, automobile-centric, suburban part of the country? What are the schools like? What are the values associated with those schools for your kids? What are the economics of a move like that? What will it cost to do it? Um, a whole, what is your relationship to nature versus proximity to interesting you know, restaurants? Uh, all of these different values. What about the conversation of clever men and clubs? What's going to happen to that uh, when you move to the suburbs? All of these things that are there in Darwin's list and in our own list that we make like this that occupy kind of different parts of the spectrum of being a sentient person alive in the world, um, and that are often in conflict with each other, right? Um, that, that's the kind of hallmark of a decision like this. And as you'll see, this is a really key point of the book, they inevitably involve a whole range of unknowables about the future. Like you haven't yet moved to California. What, you don't know what that will really feel like. You don't know what kind of person you'll be there. Um, and so they're immensely challenging for, for all those reasons. There are limits to what we can know. They involve all these different parts of our, our lives and trying to figure out how to prioritize or balance and make those choices extremely difficult. And I, I have to tell you, one of the reasons why this book took so long to write, I kept getting distracted and working on other projects. This is part of the reason. But the other part of the reason is a certain level of humility in thinking about this because I, want, I wanted this book to be useful to people. Like I wanted, I did want it on some level to be a, a, a kind of a book of advice, of wisdom that people would read and feel that they could then go out armed with some of the insights from this book and make better decisions in their lives. That, but that's an interesting soundtrack that I wouldn't think. <laughs> that was my inner monologue that was going on. But what I <laughs> what I realized was, <laughs> oh, that's all right. That's all right. No worries. Um, what I, <laughs> what I realized, <laughs> it's not just a ringtone, it's someone talking uh, that's more disturbing. Um, so, but what I ultimately realized is that um, uh, I was concerned with the idea that here, you know, with, with any decision like this, of, of this magnitude, by definition it's unique, right? It's a unique constellation of factors coming together in someone's life that, that's causing to do this. And all of these decisions are like, they're like snowflakes, they're like fing fingerprints, they're singular. And so there was a certain level of kind of concern I had as an author. Here I was trying to give advice to someone who by definition I don't know because I'm just an author writing a book um, about a decision in their life that is by definition kind of unique, never to be repeated again. You know, how could I possibly do that? And what I ultimately came around to was that the, the tools here that I'm talking about in this book are really tools that enable you, that, that in a sense kind of trick your mind into seeing the problem that you're confronting in all of its complexity and not that, that keep you from kind of reducing it down to your initial impression or your kind of gut instinct about it or your you, that kind of typical way that we can be overconfident about a choice um, that challenge your assumptions and makes you kind of think about it from different angles. Um, and that's in a sense, in a way, the best we can do. And this is one of the ways in which these decision-making tools
do mirror some of the, uh, the techniques that, that I'd written about in terms of innovation, because that's part of the trick of being innovative as well, is to see the problem you're wrestling with or the product you're trying to bring into the world from new angles and to see new possibilities. So there is some overlap there as well. And once I saw it that way, I began to think, okay, this is actually something that I think I can contribute um, some useful insight to. And it turned out there was a lot of research out there on this that had not been popularized quite as much as it should have been um, that I was able to, to build upon. I think that that feeling of the challenge of these decisions is, is captured. There's a great quote from the Nobel laureate, Thomas Schelling, um, that, that I love. Uh, One thing a person cannot do, no matter how rigorous his analysis or heroic his imagination, is to draw up a list of things that would never occur to him. And that, in some sense, when we were thinking about the future consequences of a big decision, that is one of those, that's exactly what it is. Like, there are, th there are things out there that would never occur to you. Um, that you will encounter once you go down this path. And so part of what this is, is an elaborate exercise is to try and figure out a way to write that list of things that would never occur to you and to imagine these things that, that are in your, in your blind spot. One of the key things in terms of the approach that, that I think whatever techniques you end up using is, is really to have a process itself, right? To think about the different stages of, of making a choice. Um, and in the book, I divide the, the kind of main stages into kind of a mapping stage, a, a predicting stage, and then a deciding stage. Um, and in the mapping stage, you are very clearly trying to withhold judgment, trying to not decide. You're trying to evaluate what all the factors are. You're trying to kind of create a list of, of all those kind of slices of the spectrum that are involved in the decision, trying to figure out what, what, what's at stake fully in this choice. And crucially, you're trying to explore whether there are other alternatives that you haven't uncovered yet. So there's a wonderful scholar in kind of the management theory side of this, um, a guy named Paul Nutt, who spent a lot of the 70s, 80s, and 90s um, studying corporate decisions and real world decisions that people were making um, and setting them kind of long term. So he would go in and talk to people about a decision that they made to launch a new product or to open a new factory somewhere or to lay off some people, whatever it was. And he went back and interviewed people both about their process that they used, or more often than not, the, the, their lack of process. And, and then he came back two years later, three years later, to find out did people ultimately feel that the decision was a success, so a way of testing um, whether these long-term choices in the wild of the corporate world uh, were actually successful ones. And his work has a lot of interesting insights, but the simplest one, but I think maybe the most profound, is that most people did not have an, an initial mapping phase where they actively sought out other alternatives. Most people simply had a decision where they were to, trying to decide whether to do X or not. Um, they, he, Nutt calls these whether or not decisions, right? You're trying to decide, should we do this or should we not do this? And when people limited their frame of reference to that one choice, that kind of up or down vote on, uh, on um, uh, whether or not decision, those people were more likely than not uh, unhappy with the outcome at the end of the process two or three years later. But there was a subset of folks, about 20%, 25%, who actively did kind of carve out time at the beginning of the process to explore other alternatives. And maybe it wasn't just should we do this plan or not, it was maybe there's a plan B and maybe there's a plan C and maybe there's a plan D out there. And folks who had spent time in that mapping phase, that sometimes called divergence phase, where you're trying to just come up with lots of different ideas, um, those folks, even if they ended up going with their original choice, um, those folks ended up being much more happy in the long run with the decisions that they'd made, uh, precisely because they'd taken that time to kind of multiply, diversify their options. Not describes it as switching from a whether or not decision to a which one decision. And there's a great example of that in here. This is a, an abandoned railroad line, an industrial railroad line on the west side of Manhattan. Some of you, I'm sure, can figure out what this is. That for many years, for about 50 years, served the west side of Manhattan when the, uh, there was a working industrial harbor along the Hudson. Uh, and so people would unload their cargo onto these freight trains and ship it up um, 30 blocks uh, to the kind of commercial center of, of Midtown. And gradually, over the 50s and 60s, uh, the, the working harbor along the Hudson 
uh, moved elsewhere to, to Brooklyn and other places, and all those docks kind of closed down. And so by 1981, this was basically obsolete. In 1981, the last train uh, went down this track uh, carrying one box of frozen turkeys. I don't know why they just decided that one box was necessary to make that trip, but that was his last, last journey. And then for 20 years, it just sat there as an eyesore, rusting away, um, covered with graffiti. Uh, every now and then, kind of kids would go up there and, and drink beer. Um, but basically, it was blocked off from the public, and it darkened the streets uh, that people had to walk underneath it. And it had zero function. And so for 20 years, the only question that was asked about this place was a classic whether or not question, which is, should we tear it down or not? <coughs> should we just leave it there to rust away, or should we get rid of it because it's useless? But then, in the early 2000s, another possibility emerged thanks to people who were not officially part of the decision-making process at all. They were not part of the city government. They were not part of the company that owned the rail lines. They were people who lived in the neighborhood that the tracks went through in Chelsea. Uh, they were an artist and a photographer and a, and a writer. And they got the idea, and based in part on some pictures that people had taken uh, of this kind of strange, wild landscape that had been reclaimed by nature in the middle of bustling Manhattan that this should become a park. And they said, this is a whole new vista on the city. It kind of snakes its way through all these blocks. You're up above the traffic. Um, you get little glimpses of the river. This, this would be a really fascinating park. And so they petitioned people. They built up a lot of uh, interest in it. And by uh, about seven or eight years ago, it, it launched as the Highline Park. And it's now, I think, widely considered one of the most successful and acclaimed urban parks, new urban parks. Uh, uh, in the last 20 years. Um, it's so successful, in fact, that it's much more crowded than this now. Um, and it's now increasingly being lined with glass, uh, super fancy luxury condos. Um, and so it's kind of had a creative, destructive success uh, from, from, from the innovation of, of turning it into a park. But it was a great idea. And crucially, it happened because people outside the decision-making process were, were, had a different angle had a different way of looking at it, and they were willing to kind of contemplate this other option. Um, and so that's part of it, is, is having this ability to kind of imagine alternatives, to imagine, to kind of see around the limitations of our, of our vision. And this is something I, I've been interested in for a long time. Um, it, it shows up in a lot of the work on innovation, um, is it, studying people who fail to see things that with hindsight seem obvious, right? When you look at the High Line now and you're like, well, that's a fantastic idea for a park. But it, no one thought of it for 20 years. And there are many cases in the history of innovation where you have situations like that, where things that the brilliant people working on problems, trying to come up with great ideas and solutions, fail to see something that now we look at and we say, why, did, why couldn't you see that? And I think it's important to kind of study those cases. We tend to tell the history of, uh, 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 of new ideas and the history of, uh, of decisions, we tend to talk about them in terms of the successes, right? We tend to talk about the, the great triumphs. We don't spend enough time talking about the near misses or the places where people were strangely um, blind to something that, that should have, from our perspective, been obvious to them. And so I've written about this a lot because I think by studying those cases, we can learn a lot about the blind spots that we might have on our own perspective with whatever problem we're wrestling with. Um, and one of those stories, it's actually not in Farsighted, but I thought it would be interesting to share here. It's, it was actually in the book I wrote, uh, How We Got to Now, which was also a TV series, um, is a story about a, <clears throat> a French inventor uh, in the 1850s who was a guy named Edward Leon Scott de Martinville. Uh, and in the 1850s, uh, he invented a device for, in the first one of its kind in history, for recording audio. Uh, he called it the phon phonautograph, um, the self-writing of sound. And it was this, he got a patent for it in 1851. It was this extraordinary device. It would take in sound waves from the upper left-hand corner into this vessel that was kind of wrapped in a parchment. And the parchment would vibrate and pass on those sound waves through its vibrations down to a little thin pig's bristle. And the bristle would vibrate. And it would then write the shape of the sound wave onto this rotating disk. And then you could unfurl this piece of paper and see the sound wave encoded there. Um, he called that a phonautogram, like a telegram. And no one had ever kind of captured, recorded audio before. Now, if you know anything about the history of audio technology, you probably are thinking now, wait a second, Thomas Edison, 
invented the phonograph in the 1870s, how is it that this guy was 25 years ahead, when you're 25 years ahead of Thomas Edison, that's pretty impressive. Um, why does everybody know about the phonograph and Thomas Edison and not know about Edward Leon Scott, to Scott to, to, to Martinville and the phonograph? And the answer is that Scott, for all of his genius, had this crucial blind spot in his ability to kind of think about the problem that he was wrestling with, which is this contraption, as brilliant as it was, failed to include one key feature. And that feature was playback. There was no way to listen to the audio that you had recorded. This turns out to be a very highly sought after feature in consumer electronic audio devices that people buy. Uh, people really like to hear the audio uh, that's been recorded, not just look at it. Uh, <laughs> and so basically this never really took off. Um, and when Edison figured out this problem of playback, uh, he became the success we remember. And what I find so fascinating about this is that it wasn't as if Scott was trying to solve this problem of play, playback. It was so thoroughly in his blind spot that he failed to even think of it as, as something he should strive towards. Which raises a question of what the hell was he thinking, right? Why would anybody just want to have scribbles of sound waves? And the answer to that is that he was obsessed with stenography and dictation. And he thought that if you could record somebody speaking, you would create this little scribble of the sound waves of their voice. And he'd seen how people who'd learn how to take shorthand um, could scribble on a page in real time as someone was speaking. If you understood the language of shorthand, you could look at that and turn that back into words and sentences in your head. He thought that that process could be automated. And that basically, people would learn to read the language of sound waves. And eventually, once they'd seen them, they would be able to translate those little scribbles, uh, just as they had done with alphabets before that, into words and sentences and, and comprehensible language. And if you think about it, that was a pretty good idea. It was a pretty good bet. No one had ever tried it before. It seemed logical. Unfortunately, that is not a property of the human brain. Humans cannot, to this day, they cannot do this. Um, and we now, of course, can scan these things into a computer. And in fact, a couple of years ago, people found these recordings in the Paris archives, and they scanned them into a computer and played them back. And what they heard initially, they thought they heard the sound of a little girl singing. But they realized they were playing it back at twice the recorded speed. And that it was actually, once they slowed it down, it was Scott from the grave singing Eau Claire de la Lune. Uh, 150 years later, he finally got playback for his device. It was too late for him. Uh, there are those, and those sounds are online somewhere if you, if you search their fast. They're very haunting. They're the first recorded human voice uh, in history, um, 25 years before anything else like it. Um, but here's why I, I wanted to bring this up. I often think about like why this idea that seems so obvious to us was in Scott's blind spot, in a sense. And I think the key thing here is that he was working alone, and that he was working within uh, the constraints of a single metaphor, a single way of looking at the problem. So he had this metaphor of stenography, and he was thinking about automating dictation. But if he'd been working on the problem with someone with a different set of skills, or a different set of passions, or even hobbies, he might have actually been able to see around that blind spot. I always think if he'd been working with a musician, that the musician would have said at a certain point, I like what you've done, Edward. It's very impressive. But wouldn't it be great if I could record my violin or something and we could then hear it later, right? And he might have then gone off and figured out how to create wax cylinders and, and created the phonograph um, and beat Thomas Edison to the punch by 20 years. And this is where we get to one of the, the, the most kind of important and kind of recurring themes of, of both the innovation literature and of Farsighted, which is the importance of diversity in making complex decisions and coming up with, with new ideas. Um, th this is one of the most kind of robust findings in the social sciences and uh, kind of psychology over the last 20 or 30 years, that diverse groups, whether you measure that diversity in terms of gender diversity, ethnic diversity, economic diversity, diversity of intellectual background, um, diversity of, of age, generational diversity, Wherever you expand the diversity of a group, um, that group will make, on, on whole, smarter, more original decisions, come up with more original ideas, see around each other's blind spots, contribute new metaphors, new frameworks, new ways of thinking about a problem. And to me, this is a really crucial point. Um, this is a really crucial political point right now. Um, 
we, even when we celebrate diversity in the parts of our culture or political conversation where we celebrate diversity, we often describe it in terms of, in a sense, language that has kind of been carried over from the civil rights movement in the United States at least, which is that we want to have more diverse leaders, for instance, in, uh, in our political bodies, uh, where we want to have more diversity at the top of our corporations or in our universities because we want to be in a more tolerant society. We want to have a quality of opportunity. We want different groups to be represented and have their interests represented or have a seat at the table, all of which is incredibly important and, and, and true it, and, and values that we should continue championing. But we should also make this other additional point, which is that we want to have that diversity because those groups will be collectively smarter. They will come up with more original decisions. They will be better at governing. They will be better at um, steering the ship of state um, or the companies that they run. And that to me is, I mean, you know, in, in the US right now, um, the new Congress that just got voted in, uh, trying to stay optimistic uh, here, um, is the most diverse in the history of the United States Congress, um, both in terms of women, um, other ethnic groups, but also generational. Um, age diversity uh, is, is a great uh, attribute. If you look back at the American founding fathers, one of the things that's really striking about them, and this is a little bit, you know, visible if any of you got to see Hamilton. Um, there's an incredible range uh, in terms of the age of the founders. Franklin was very old. Um, Hamilton was like 21, right? So you have these people collaborating on this great project with two or three generations kind of separating them almost. Um, you've got kind of people who could be grandfathers or almost great grandfathers working with people who could be their great grandchildren uh, on this project. And I think that's no accident. I think the creativity of that culture um, had partially to do with the, the, the range of ages involved in the, in the decisions. And that's one of the reasons why, I mean, I'm, I'm playing to the home team here, but that's part of the mission here at the Intellectual Forum is to create environments where people with different values, different perspectives, different forms of expertise, where you have so much intellectual firepower at a place like Cambridge, do you have enough spaces where the, those different kinds of intelligence can come together and, and share ideas and challenge each other and, and uh, provoke each other in, in, in ways. Creating spaces that do that, um, I think, is something that is wonderful to see in an academic context. And I think it's wonderful to see uh, a little bit of hope in that direction in, in a political context in the, in the states. And it reminds me, again, of another story that's not in Farsighted, but that I talked about at the end of how we got to now. Um, which is, again, about seeing around blind spots. This is Ada, Ada Lovelace. Um, how many people know the story of Ada Lovelace? Uh, that's interesting. Not quite as many as I would think. So this, increasingly, I think she will be um, more widely recognized for what she did. So Ada Lovelace is um, widely considered to be the first software programmer of all time, despite the fact that she uh, was born around 1805 or something like that. Um, well, before we think of the age of computers. Um, she uh, was a kind of a math prodigy. And in the 1830s, she started working with Charles Babbage, who famously kind of invented the programmable computer in the form of a machine called the Difference Engine and the Analytic Engine. In the 1830s, one of the great kind of conceptual leaps um, you know, he tried to invent basically a digital computer in the middle of the steam age, um, which made it basically impossible to work as a product, an actual functioning product. But he did come up with a lot of the basic ideas that then had to be separately invented 100 years later about how you would program such a thing, the idea of a CPU, which he called the mill, the idea of RAM and some per permanent storage. All of those concepts are there in these technologies that he invented. Ada Lovelace began working with him, and she famously wrote this kind of, she translated this article and, and wrote a footnote to it about Babbage's work. And in that footnote, she wrote some lines of code that would work on this machine. And as far as we know, this is the first example of code ever being written for a computer. So she is rightly, I think, considered the first programmer, which is an important thing to celebrate in an age where we need to have more women programmers and engineers. Um, but here's the thing that I find really fascinating about her life. She did something else which is in that same document, she speculated on what uses this machine could have in the future. And she made this very extraordinarily kind of ahead of its time statement about how everybody who's thinking about this contraption, including Babbage himself, is largely seeing it as a contraption for crunching numbers, that it's just a very complicated calculator that can do complicated numerical processing. But she said, 
fundamentally, this is a machine that's about manipulating symbols, and there's no reason why, at a sufficient point in the future, with sufficient level of advancement in the technology, that it couldn't be used for creative purposes. In fact, it's perfectly reasonable to imagine that a machine like this could be used to compose music, that it could actually be trained to compose its own music in the future. This was an idea that was genuinely 100 and you know, 40 years ahead of its time on some level. Nobody really began to think about computers as tools for play and art and creativity really until the 1970s. Uh, little pockets in the 1960s. Um, and she was able to make that leap. Even Babbage himself didn't really make that leap. And the question is why? And I think the reason is, is that she herself is an example of the importance of kind of diverse perspectives colliding, in her case, in, in a single mind, because her background was so unique. Because not only was she a math prodigy, but she was also the daughter of Lord Byron. Her, her, her father was the great, you know, kind of rogue rock star romantic poet of the age um, who had left her mother and run off also with his cousin, I believe. So that was apparently rampant in that period. Um, and it become this incredible kind of incest scandal, you know, in society. Um, and Ada's mother was so horrified by this that she, she wanted to basically expel any of this uh, lurid romantic poetry uh, sensibility that her daughter might have carried over from her father. And so she made her study math, which of course was incredibly unusual during that period. And so Ada, herself was the product of the collision between two different, radically different worlds, right? The world of art and poetry and rebellion and the world of math and numbers and calculations. And what she was able to see, the way she was able to see around this blind spot arose precisely because she was able to, because she was at that intersection point between those different ways of looking at the world. And so seeking out those intersection points, um, trying to meet people who challenge our expectations or bring different skills, um, different ways of looking at the world, that is an extraordinary asset. And when we have places or environments that allow that kind of commingling of different perspectives, those spaces are incredibly valuable for us. These are all, in a sense, kind of predictions, right? Um, they're predictions about where this technology might go. Um, and they're predict when, whenever we're predicting, particularly when we're making long-term predictions, even if it's on, in our own personal lives, there is a, a certain level of unknowability, right? We don't know how the future is going to turn out. And so in, in writing Farsighted, I tried to go back and look at, one, studies that have been done on prediction. Um, and also to look at places where we have empirically gotten better at predicting the future, to see if there's something that we can learn about. Because every long-term decision is fundamentally a prediction about future events, right? We, we choose this path because we think in two years or five years, we'll be better off, or the company will be better off, or society will be better off. The, the canonical study of predictions and forecasting um, in the kind of political civic space is this great um, set of studies done by Philip Tetlock. How many people are familiar with Tetlock's work? Okay, good. Well, introducing new concepts, that's good. Um, Tetlock wrote a book called uh, Expert Political Judgment. And he had this wonderful technique where he went around and asked all these, he created basically a forecasting contest where he went around and interviewed all these people who were allegedly experts in their fields. Um, pundits who write op-eds and people who appear on television and some superstar academics and so on. And he asked them to make forecasts on a kind of two to five year scale in their chosen field, right? So you're a Russian specialist. Tell me what's going to happen to the Soviet Union. This was a while ago. Um, you're uh, an expert in economics. Tell us what's going to happen to interest rates over the next two or five years, whatever. And then he had the audacity to go back and see how people did. And what he found was that they were terrible at predicting the future. Um, and that there was, in fact, a inverse correlation between how famous the expert was and how successful their predictions were. Uh, the more famous they were, they, the worse they were. In general, they were worse than chance. They were worse than a dart throwing chimp, throwing in a dartboard, coming up with answers. Um, and, but he did find, so that was one thing, but he did find that there was a subset of people who he subsequently called super forecasters who were better than chance. They weren't perfect. Nobody has a crystal ball with these complex systems, but they were better than chance. If you were trying to figure out what was going to happen in this particular field, whatever field it was, you were better off listening to them and paying attention to them than ignoring them altogether. And then he tried to figure out what made those people different. And 
he spent a lot of time interviewing them and interviewing their peers who were less successful. And what he ultimately found out is that he, the, the folks who were successful forecasters were much less likely to have a single monolithic theory of the world. Um, they, they did not kind of believe everything revolved around this force or this model or this particular interpretation of things. They were much more eclectic in their interests. They ranked very highly in psychological profiles for the, the category openness to experience, which is sometimes what we call curiosity. They were just people who were interested in things, even if they didn't really know what the point was. They were dabblers. They had a lot of hobbies. Um, and partially that makes sense in terms of everything we've talked about. In their own minds, they were kind of diverse, right? They, had, they, they weren't just looking at the world through a single lens. They had a, kind of a, a number of different lenses, a number of different links and connections that they were open to, to making in, in their work. Um, so that's part of the lesson, I think, of diversity, is that it not only makes us better at coming up with alternatives, but actually seeing into the future when we have more eclectic perspectives. But the other way in which we've gotten better at predicting the future is in systems like weather and climate. Um, we've seen, a, people always joke about weather forecasts being terrible, but we actually have seen in my lifetime, they've gone from being useless beyond a two-day framework to being quite useful on a 10-day framework. Um, and certainly very good on kind of that five-day scan. So that's a major improvement in forecasting. And of course, we are able to make scientifically reasonable uh, statements about potential changes to climate that are happening on a 50-year scale or a 100-year scale. We have a lot of consensus now that we can at least understand the broad sweep of that story. So we've greatly extended our kind of vision of the future. And the question is, how did we get to do that? And part of it is that we understand the kind of underlying dynamics of weather better than we did 50 years ago when I was born. But a big part of it is that we run what are called ensemble simulations where we create a simulation of the environment um, and you know, there's, a, there's a hurricane uh, brewing in the Atlantic and so we simulate the hurricane in its current state as best we can in these giant climate weather modeling supercomputers. And then we run thousands and thousands of simulations of the next 10 days where we change small different variables and we look at all those different outputs and we notice that 70% of the time the hurricane goes north and 20% of the time the hurricane goes south and 10% of the time it stalls or whatever the result is. And that's where you get that there's a 75% chance it's going to do that is because we've run these endless simulations. And that has over time given us the ability to predict big storm systems and, and their direction. We're not perfect at it, but we're way better than we were just a while ago. And it's that process of kind of running simulations again and again and again and again that help us to understand what is otherwise a very difficult thing to predict, a large complex system like a, a hurricane. So I started thinking from that, well, what is the equivalent of those kinds of simulations in our own lives, right? There is not right now kind of computer software where we can say, okay, uh, let's simulate the move to California. Uh, let's run it a thousand times where we stay and a thousand times where we we go and see what the results are. Unfortunately, that some future version of you know, The Sims may allow us to do this, but right now, we can't do that. And, and one thing I think that we have, and this is something I spend a bunch of the time in the book talking about, um, is that to me, this is one of the, the, the ways in which great storytelling and narratives and, and, and novels are, are, are such an extraordinary tool for um, people in improving their decision making because that's what, in a sense, part of what the, the role of something like the novel is, is to simulate a life that we enter into, we experience the consciousness of another person, we watch them making a, a challenging decision. In the hands of a talented novelist, we see all the different factors coming into the decision. We see that full spectrum mapping of a choice. The book, in Farsight, I spent a lot of time talking about the decisions that are at the heart of Middlemarch, um, George Eliot's masterpiece, which is maybe the best book, I think, in the canon of kind of analyzing a complicated choice on all those different scales of experience. Um, and so, yes, we can't run parallel simulations of our own lives, but we can kind of venture into these fictional lives and watch people making choices and train ourselves to be more perceptive to all those different factors that might influence a, a choice. And, and so that, the, the fictional world, in a sense, is a little bit like those ensemble, ensemble simulations of, of weather forecasting. But it turns out, actually, we, we have an innate version of this that um, we do all the time, that we do at just kind of faster scales. 
in the early days of uh, brain imaging, uh, when the first technologies arose, PET and fMRI, that enabled us to see actual activity in the brain more or less in real time where we could see different shifts in blood flow um, and kind of energy consumption in different parts of the brain as people were doing tasks that they'd been told to execute while in these brain scanners. When this technology first appeared in the, in the 80s and early 90s, all these neuroscientists and cognitive psychologists and anybody who was interested in the brain was thrilled because they could suddenly see where these things were happening in the past. The only way you could really tell what part of the brain was used for language and what part of the brain was used for high level planning was when people had catastrophic brain injuries like Phineas Gage where part of their brain would get damaged and then they would stop being able to do that thing and so they would learn kind of inversely um, through damage. This way you could take somebody, put them in a scanner and say, hey, we're studying how people do mental math, so do some mental math and we'll scan your brain and we'll be able to tell um, which part of the brain lights up when you do that. So it was going to be this extraordinary breakthrough. But to do that, they needed basically a control, right? The brain is generating all this activity all the time. Um, and so you needed to see the difference um, between somebody doing mental math or processing human faces or doing long-term planning. Uh, you need to have something to compare it to so that you could actually make sense of the image. And so what they would do in these early studies is they would put people into the scanner and they would say, okay, now, for the next minute while we scan you, we want you to do mental math, mental arithmetic. And then they would do a second pass where they would say, just sit there and don't do anything. And what they found, and this is part of this imaging, is that when they went back and looked at the control study where they were asked to do nothing, their brains were more active than they had been when they were instructed to do a specific task. And they were more active in the evolutionarily modern parts of the brain. So it seemed when you put people, stuck their heads in a machine and asked them to, to do nothing, they were using a, a remarkable amount of energy. And they were lighting up the brains that made us the most, the most distinctly human parts of our, of our brain. And what they eventually realized, is what was happening, is that people were daydreaming. They were mind wandering. And this is one of those great discoveries where you really needed to see everybody daydreams, everybody mind wanders, but we didn't realize until we had these machines how, in a sense, computationally intensive, how energy intensive mind wandering and daydreaming is and how, how human-centric this activity is. And as they probed more deeply into this phenomenon, they, they would start to kind of interview people about what they were really doing when they were daydreaming. And what they realized was that they were spending a disproportion of that time building simulated models of the future. And that there was a, a far, you know, kind of dominant, there were way more thought about near future activities um, than there was about the present or the past. So people were constantly, you put them in a state where they were mind wandering and their brain would just naturally switch into this mode where it would go, okay, so next week I have that big meeting with my boss and maybe if I ask him for the raise and maybe I could probably put that down payment on that place and I wonder what would happen there. And people were just building these scenarios in their heads and imagining um, future events. And this, the argument it's developed over the last 20 or year, so years, there's now a whole kind of model of human intelligence, sometimes called homo prospectus, um, which argues that this may be, if not the, certainly one of the key defining traits of human intelligence. We don't think that animals are able to think forward, have much of a sense of the future at all. They certainly can't make plans beyond a very short amount of time. Um, and so the idea that we are able to build these rapid fire simulations of future events turns out, we think, to be crucial to our intelligence and our ability to, in part, to innovate, right? We have to be able to imagine a future where this new thing we're trying to invent might exist and how it might be used. Um, if you don't have a concept of the future, you can't, you can't do that. And so the, now there's this theory that this kind of mind wandering and daydreaming is, 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 is one of the ways in which we kind of explore the possibility space of, uh, of decisions that are in front of us. And what we do is basically we build a little simulated scenario and we test it out with the emotional system of the brain. So we imagine what it would be like to ask that boss for the raise. And that triggers its kind of simulated emotional response in us, a feeling of like anxiety or excitement or pride or whatever it is. And based on that feedback, we then go back and modify the scenario and test another one. And we do that again and again and again. And it's one of these things that, like so many properties of, uh, of being our particular species, the things we do best we don't think are hard because we, it's part of our kind of biological heritage, something that our brains do, do naturally. So to me, that 
is, is, a, is an important lesson in terms of our own practical kind of life, right? That do, do we spend enough time in that state? In a, in a way, I think some of the arguments we have about technology today have it backwards, and we talk about technology and screen culture and smartphones and all that being um, taking away our attention or causing us to be too distracted or cutting into our focus. But in fact, what happens when you're with a screen or you're checking Twitter or you're playing Fortnite is you're intensely focused, actually. You're looking at that thing. It's taking up your consciousness. And what we need more of is, in a sense, the opposite of that is to be unfocused, to allow our minds to wander, to walk around, go for a long walk or sit in the shower or do whatever it is to, to let your mind kind of drift into these places. Uh, because that is, a, that is a crucial part of the process of, of deliberating is imagining these futures and, and building these kind of simulations in our head. I'll tell you just two more things and then we can open it up to your own observations. That process of storytelling or of building simulations of the future is something we also do as part of a, a deliberative process as well, right? There's a whole genre, sometimes called scenario planning, that's often used in the corporate world, um, but also used in environmental studies, environmental planning, and, and urban planning, and so on, where people sit there and start to go through this exercise of thinking, OK, what might happen over the next 10 years or 50 years? And let's imagine not just one story, this is what's crucial about it, but let's imagine multiple stories. Um, let's imagine multiple outcomes, not just the one that comes kind of immediately to us. And by telling those stories, we can make more informed decisions about what we want to do because we've imagined different possible futures. And one of the most powerful exercises, I think, is, is a technique that was kind of created by a psychologist named Gary Klein. And he calls it a, a, a pre-mortem. And a pre-mortem is an exercise you do when you've kind of reached the end of the decision-making process and you have decided on a path. You've, you've mapped it all out. You've come up with other alternatives. You've consulted with a diverse group of people. Um, you know, you've, you've built all these different simulations to, to the extent that you can. You've told different scenario plans. And then you basically decided, this is what we're going to do. At that point, Klein advises you to run this exercise called a pre-mortem. A pre-mortem, as you can imagine, is the opposite of a post-mortem. A post-mortem is the patient is dead. You have to figure out what killed the patient. In a pre-mortem, it's the patient is going to die. Tell the story of what killed the patient, i.e., you have decided to go down this path, sit down and tell the story of how that decision turns out to be a catastrophic failure two years from now. And when you run that exercise, it turns out to be far more useful in unlocking um, the, the kind of blind spots or seeing around the blind spots um, and really seeing the full complexity of the choice as opposed to just saying to people, here's the choice we're thinking about making. Do you see any flaws? When you say it that way, people are like, no, it's great. We're fantastic. We, we've all agreed this is what we want to do. When you force them to tell the story of how this thing fails, then they see new problems that they hadn't necessarily seen. So it's a, it's a very useful exercise. And in the book, I spent a lot of time talking about the decision process that went into the uh, ultimately successful raid on bin Laden's lair, seen here in, in Pakistan, um, which was a nine-month process. And as so often happens with these kinds of things, the raid itself is what you end up celebrating. It's what everybody says, well, it was a great victory. You know, They got it right. But the decision process is what really made it possible. And that was something that was run inside the Obama administration back in those days. Um, where they deliberately went through a lot of the techniques that I talk about in the book, where they were challenging. They had an opening divergence stage where they tried to come up with lots of different explanations. They then tried to come up with lots of different alternate ways that they could get access to the, to the compound and ways that they could ultimately attack it once they decided that it was, in fact, bin Laden in there or that they thought it was likely that it was bin Laden in. So they used all these exercises. They, they challenged their assumptions. Um, and one of the things they did at the end, once they had decided that they were going to do this moonlit helicopter raid without telling the Pakistanis um, going in through their airspace, they ran a pre-mortem basically saying, how could this go wrong? And one of the things that they came up with was the Pakistanis might be so offended that we did this, executed this raid without telling them that they might kick us out of their airspace and land routes altogether. And those were the primary conduits that the US military was using to get uh, supplies to the troops in Afghanistan. And so because they had run that pre-mortem, they actually, two months before they executed the raid, they opened up quietly, without explaining why they were doing it, a second route into Afghanistan that bypassed Pakistan altogether. That's how far ahead they were thinking. And it was precisely because they didn't 
go with their gut. They didn't just decide, yeah, this is the way to go, you know, and you know, shoot first and ask questions later, right? They spent the nine months working the problem, thinking about the possibilities, and crucially thinking about how they might have gotten it wrong or how it might fail despite their best intentions. And those are the kinds of exercises that I think we want to celebrate and champion and look for in the people who represent us and who lead us, right? I mean, you never hear a presidential debate where somebody asks a question, how do you go about making a decision? What's your process? Maybe that's the most important question, right? That we want to know, will they make good choices when they're, they're in office? But we don't think about that because we don't think about decision making as a skill, as a practice that one can develop and, and enhance. And that leads me just to my kind of final point, which is that I have grown increasingly convinced writing this book and in talking about it that decision making should be a required class for every high school student, every 15, 16, 17 year old student should take a class in how to make better decisions in your life. Like this is, I, I, I have a good education despite the fact that I was a semiotics major. I, like I went to some good schools. Uh, and, but no one ever sat me down and said, okay, like, let, we're gonna spend a semester or a year talking about how to make good decisions in your professional life, in your personal life, in your civic life as a voter, as a member of a jury, um, as a member of a community or a city, um, <laughs> or someone who's thinking about whether they get married or not. Like we, we don't teach this. The only place really where it's taught is occasionally it's in kind of philosophy and, and in business schools. Um, but it's really not a part of the core. And it occurs to me, and I, I say this as a parent of three kids who are you know, teenagers, um, watching all the things that they're being taught that I know they will never use again the second the final exam is over. Um, that a class like this, uh, how to make good decisions would be a class that every single person would find useful on some level. No matter what you do with your life, whether you have a profession or not, you will want to be able to make complex decisions more artfully, uh, more effectively. Um, if you can improve the odds on that, that will be useful. And I don't mean to think about it in a purely utilitarian or vocational kind of sense. Um, I believe in school as a place like this institution where you should be surprised and you should stumble across things you didn't know you needed and school should be an engine of serendipity where you're constantly stumbling across things that you would have never found otherwise. Um, but think about what would be in this class, right? You would learn about neuroscience and the default network of the brain. You would learn, you would read Middlemarch, you'd read the utilitarian philosophers, you would study military history, you'd study cognitive psychology and group psychology. You would have a whole range of different disciplines. It would be itself a kind of intellectual kind of feast of diverse perspectives. But all of those would be in the, in the service of learning a skill that all of us can use in the most intimate parts of our lives and in the most public civic parts of our lives as well. So thank you for listening. I appreciate it very much. That was really fascinating. Thank, thank you very much. We do have time for uh, a, a reasonable range of questions. If I can remind you to wait until the microphone gets you, gets you. We have the first one over here. If there's a second one, we can get the microphone out to you. If not, you can. And there's one over there as well. Uh, do, you have, do you see any utility in um, the idea of lateral thinking? Uh, Edward de Bono's not a binary decision, yes or no, but interjection of the po, the possible. Uh, yeah, absolutely, um, and that was that was a big. That, that's exactly the zone where um, the innovation kind of theory and the decision making theory overlapped. Um, and the the there are a lot of great exercises for introducing that idea of kind of okay, you've got your officially you've got your goal, your object here, but you know it's important to actually swerve away from that on some level. Um, if you're going to be really creative or you're going to open yourself up to new possibilities. Um, De Bono did, did extraordinary work with that. My favorite example of a technique for this um, is in the creative space. Um, Brian Eno, the great musician and producer, has a technique that he uses with, um, with very successful bands when he's 
producing their albums. So, you know, he's produced, obviously, Bowie and U2 and Coldplay and all these artists. And so you have these artists who have, particularly bands, have spent a lot of time together and they've gotten kind of stuck in a certain way of playing together. Um, and part of his job as a producer is to get them to move in these unusual lateral directions and not just focus on their normal way of playing so that they'll be more creative and come up with a new sound that will be interesting. And so what he does at the beginning of the session, which I love, when he's sitting down to record a new album with these people, is that he makes them all switch their instruments. And so he goes in to like, meet with you two, and he's like, OK, you know, The Edge, you're playing drums. And Bono, you're, you're playing keyboards over there, whatever. And he has everybody play. And, what, and they, they have do a couple of days of sessions in the studio where they're playing each other's instruments. And what, what he says about it is that they, they sound terrible on some level. They, 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 there's definitely a decrease in the actual you know, musical quality of the sound that they make as a band. But through that process, inevitably, they make some new sound that w they wouldn't have stumbled a across in their, in their normal configuration where the Edge is playing guitar and Bono is singing or whatever it is. And then they go back to their regular instruments and they say, OK, how do we get to that sound actually playing the instruments we know how to play? And that exercise, I mean, I think that's a great exercise. Just think about what's the equivalent of that in your own world? Like, what is the equivalent of playing other people's instruments or trying on other roles that you're demonstrably worse at, um, but that by entering into that other perspective or trying your hand at that, you, you end up um, learning something about what you're really trying to do. It's another reason why a, a constant recurring theme through all the people that I've profiled in the years about innovative thinking is one recurring quality they have is they have a lot of hobbies. I mean, think about Darwin and all of his different hobbies, right? They, that, that, in a sense, hobbies are a way of diversifying your, your interests um, and influence without actually even talking to other people, right? When you have a lot of different interests, you've got your main focus, um, but you have all these lateral kind of obsessions. And you, know, you spend your day doing your day job, but then you go home and you're an amateur musician, and there's something about song you're working on that triggers an idea about the way you can structure this thing you're working on at home. Um, that's, I think, I, I, I think a great kind of technique for being, for being more creative and having those kind of lateral insights. Can I just make another quick yeah, question? Sure. Uh, very quickly. Yeah, very quickly. Yeah. Sorry. Um, Bernard said with problem solving, there's, there are three main problems. You either run out of information or you face an obstacle. In both cases, you know what you're dealing with. If the answer is, going down the tube, the answer's a little side-turning, you miss it. And they're increasing the RI answers that we don't realize that the answer is there. Right. That's great. And if we go over there, uh, yeah. Uh, yes. I just wanted to ask you a little bit about um, decision-making by groups. Yeah. Um, so uh, in the corporate or business field, uh, you might think people would make decisions and be very interested about the best outcome. My personal experience is that Groups tend to make decisions that preserve the social order and reinforce the hierarchy. Yeah. Could you explain what's going on there and how might I undermine that? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, it's true. On the one hand, you have, you have two kind of competing forces. When you have too much uh, homogeneity in the group, y you quickly get pulled into the orbit of groupthink, where everybody just consolidates around the initial consensus, whatever it's perceived to be. And there just is this seemingly almost like tidal psychological pressure to kind of gravitate towards that and figure out what that is. And everybody just is like, yes, 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 I agree to that, right? Um, diversity breaks that up, right? It's one of the reasons why it's a powerful force when you have different perspectives, whatever. By the way, I, I shouldn't undermine, uh, undersell this. D diversity also creates tension um, and conflict, right? It doesn't make it sometimes. It, it, Homogeneous groups are more fun, oftentimes, because everybody's like, yes, we've figured it out. This is great. They just don't generate particularly good results. Um, the other problem is there is this attraction to the uh, whoever is the leader in the room, right? The people just are trying to figure out what the boss thinks. And then the, the room gravitates to what the imagined kind of perception of what the boss is. And, and so there are a couple of techniques that people have used for group decision making that are interesting. Um, one of the there's a lot that's been written about the, the Bay of Pigs controversy in, in, in decision making in the United States and kind of political history. And um, 
which is a kind of catastrophic decision, followed by the Cuban Missile Crisis, where arguably, although it got way too close, the decision process was, was better, and that Kennedy had adjusted the internal decision-making process because of failures he'd seen in uh, the Bay of Pixing. And one of the things was he removed himself from a lot of the discussions in, in the latter, in, in the um, uh, missile crisis, because it felt like the room was just gravitating towards whatever he thought, and so there, there wasn't room for debate because of that. Um, but the other technique that um, Kahneman and Tversky talk about a little bit is uh, group decisions where the group is actually, uh, the group decision making is done through separate interviews. Um, so you actually assemble a really interesting eclectic group of people to help you make the decision, but you don't put them in the same room together. Um, and you go around and talk to them individually about their different perspectives and, and someone synthesizes those ideas and maybe then kind of reconvenes the group. Um, but there's an initial phase where people are separate so you kind of basically tamp down that tendency for the, for the group thing to emerge or for tensions to emerge between those different points of, of view if it's a diverse group. Um, and the other technique that's like that is when there's a group that is convened physically in a room. Um, poll the group for what it thinks the, the outcome should be, what the, what the choice should be. Um, before you start the discussion, ask them to write down privately what they think uh, the decision should be um, before they start talking. So that they're kind of, before they get into that kind of collective process where they start gravitating towards one solution, um, they've kept a kind of little register, put a little flag in the ground for, for their own kind of private belief. And that just keeps it alive a little bit more and keeps, keeps those kind of counterbalancing points of view um, alive and keeps the group think at bay a little bit. So those are some of the techniques. And there are, a few, there are, a few, there are, there are many more in the book. <laughs> um, so we'll take a question over here. I then have one uh, online. And then we'll go over there and then at the back, and that may take us to time, we'll see. But. Yeah, I was quite taken with your idea of the compulsory decision-making class at, I guess, high school level. I right. don't know. Had you thought about incentives for that? I can think of, you know, on the pupil side, you could incentivize them with the offer of an early vote. But on the educational system side, is there a way of, you know, getting that into that system? I, I mean, in terms of why you would incur, like, why people would be inclined to sign up for the class? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But, but why would they struck, you know, you have to have a class offered in the first place, I think, in most educational systems. Yeah, I mean, to me, it just seems, I mean, particularly, um, you know, in, 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 in a way, this replaces an old class that we used to have in the United States. I don't know what it's like here, but they're, they're, it used to be much more common to have a civics class. Um, and to me, this actually is a version of a civics class that would train you for the kinds of choices you would have to make as a member of a society. Um, but that would also be useful for all other things too, right? You would be like, well, I'm, uh, I plan to go into business for myself or I plan to become a uh, scientist and I'm gonna have to make choices or I just wanna make good life choices in my life. So I would, to me, the, the appeal of it and the utility of it compared to, you know, just telling somebody they have to take chemistry even though they have no interest in that. Um, uh, is self-evident. Like, I feel like people would be kind of drawn to that because because there is something useful about it. Um, but not, it's not like, you know, shop where you learn how to fix a car or something like that, where the utility of it is very kind of limited and vocational. It's a, it's a skill that's that's broader than that. I'm trying to work on. It's one of the projects that I've got going now is to think about what a syllabus would look like for a class like that. So if you, I'm gonna, I've got a couple of things in the work that I'm that I'm working on, and if you if you're interested, I'll I'm sure I'll put something up about it at, at Twitter, Stephen B. Johnson, if, if you're interested in following it. So having said Twitter, there's a question okay. we got from yeah. Twitter. And, and if you want to send us anything, we'll happily pass it on okay. to everybody. Okay. So do follow at Intel Forum. Um, the question is from Tyler Shaws, who's been oh, yeah. following. Right. Um, what are your thoughts on artificial intelligence and how it could influence our decision making in the future? Will computers ever help us decide whether to have a second? So I, I'm glad Tyler brought that up. So. Um, I, I wrote, if people are interested, I wrote a long piece for the, for the New York Times Magazine in November, in large part about that uh, default network idea and the importance of mind wandering and kind of our running predictive scenarios about the future. One of the things that I raised in that piece is um, there are certain kinds of problems, certain kinds of situations that machine learning algorithms are getting uh, 
very already kind of scarily good at predicting the future with. Um, and it's not all problems. There's a whole set of <laughs> important problems that, for various reasons, in terms of the architecture of the problem, machine learning is useless at. Um, but there are some interesting cases. So for instance, one of the ones that is the most disturbing, I think, to people um, that I wrote about in the piece is there is a group at the University of Chicago in consultation with the Chicago Police Department that is building a machine learning algorithm that is looking through this vast repository of data um, that's generated by the Chicago Police Department um, in order to predict potential problem cops. Not criminals, but cops who might you know, eventually have an issue with being over aggressive and policing or shooting someone or whatever. Based on all this data and past data of problem cops that ended up having a real world problem, an actual problem, looking for signs in that data. And apparently the early data that they're seeing, and the, and the Chicago PD seems to be on board with this, is that the algorithm is already better than human supervisors at noticing these people before. You know, they've been running a kind of parallel simulation of it and seeing, I predict this guy will be a problem, and then sure enough, six months later, he ends up having a problem at work. So if people saw a minority report or read the Philip K. Dick, I believe, short story or novel, I can't remember which it is, um, there's this idea of pre-crime in that book, which is like that the, there are these future artificial intelligent agents that are so smart they can predict crime before it happens. And in this future, largely dystopian society, people are arrested for crimes they're about to commit before they even happen because the future has been. And that's, in a sense, what we're getting to. Now, what, what the Chicago PD is doing is, is interesting. What they, they're obviously not arresting cops for crimes they haven't committed. But what they are is suggesting that those cops might need some more support or need some counseling to help them. Potentially, that they've seen something in the data that suggests they might have issues. Would you like to have this extra support? And they're actually using machine intelligence to bring another extra human being into the equation there in an interesting way. Regardless, the, this is coming. Well, however you feel, if that makes you completely freaked out or if that makes you feel like, well, maybe we could harness that kind of predictive capability for good, um, this is what is headed our way. And we are going to see more and more decisions like that that are at least augmented by machine learning and AI. Um, and what that's going to create is, an, is another um, axis on the diversity grid or spectrum or what do you want to call it, where it's not just having different kinds of people, different kinds of backgrounds, different genders, different ages, but also machine versus human intelligence. Like, we'll, we'll assemble a group and be working on a complex problem. We'll be like, well, there aren't any bots in here. There no, there's no machine learning in here. And, the, and there are certain things that machine learning is, machine learning is way better at probability than humans are. Humans are terrible. Tversky used to say that um, humans basically like have um, three settings for probability. One is, uh, it's going to happen. Two, it's not going to happen. And then three is maybe. <laughs> like that's all that's all we can kind of keep in our mind where machines are just very good at like noticing the difference between 28% and 16% and being able to build models based on that difference and so we may be headed towards a future where we want to at least consult with the machines in making decisions like this um, we certainly don't want to just hand over the reins to them um, but that that consultation may become increasingly important so we have i think two questions one over here and then right at the back Great. Oh, good. Um, you, you may not have noticed, but we're having a little bit of trouble with decision making in oh, our no, parliament please. at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd love Julian's view on it as well. Um, I wonder how decision making transacts with yeah. democracy, and I'm wondering how deliberative democracy and, and citizens' involvement and those things um, might get us out mess for it at the moment. Uh, you know, I should have thought, I should have spent a week before I came over here just be like, what is my Brexit answer? <laughs> you know, I got my Trump, I got my Trump talking points. So the, the place where um, I think encouragingly, the place where deliberative democracy is working probably better than it ever has, certainly in, in my lifetime, I think, is on a local level, that there are a lot of great things happening right now, and in part enhanced by technology, by things that we didn't have access to 10 years ago or 20 years ago, smartphones and crowdfunding and crowdsourcing and Wikipedia-like models and things like that, Kickstarter-like models. Um, there are a lot of great things happening on the level of 
let's come together to make decisions about our local community, our knowable community of our town or our neighborhood. Um, a lot of it happening in Europe, a lot of great things happening over here, probably more than in the States, I would say, although we have some of that in Brooklyn uh, that's been pretty interesting. Um, and so I look at that and I say, okay, we, you know, when, when people, when people have a kind of a granular sense of the stakes that are involved, and it's like, it's my park potentially down the street that might get built, um, or this old eyesore might get torn down, um, or my tax dollars might get funding, create funding for this thing that I know will be built and I'll see it get built. Like that is really working. And there's a lot to be done in that direction. There's a lot of different things to explore, but we're, there's a lot of great experiments happening there. So that makes me encouraged. You know, I don't, I, there's, a, there's a big question, I mean, this is a larger point. There's a big question mark over the last two or three years I, with both Trump and Brexit, which is that, and I don't know enough about Brexit to, to say whether this is legitimate or not, but I know enough about the Trump phenomenon to say there is a legitimate chance that Trump is a weird one-off and that he, it was a very strange confluence of, of events that came together and he, he, was, he got way too close to the presidency anyway, of course, and that speaks to some of the significant failings in the Republican Party and so on, but that, the, that actually if you didn't have that very distinct cocktail of reality television, self-fundable billionaire, all the problems with Hillary, the, the, the media going in, Clinton fatigue, all these different things came together, he would have never gotten close to it. And he still lost. <laughs> and so there is, it's terrifying, but on the other hand, there's a possibility that we will look back on it and say that was not actually representative. There's a lot of, um, there are a lot of progressive things that are happening in the United States and people actually are getting more tolerant on, on the whole. If you look at the values of the American voter in terms of things like, you know, uh, gay marriage, obviously, but things like actual uh, feelings about immigration, um, feelings about gender equality, the Me Too movement. If you look, if you chart the kind of story of American values over the last 10 years, it is a really strong spike upwards towards tolerance and towards acceptance of diversity. We haven't, we haven't focused on this because this nightmarish thing is actually happening officially in terms of our, uh, you know, our, our titular leader. Um, but that process is still happening. That wave that started with kind of gay marriage through Obama, that is still there. It didn't go away. Um, and so I don't, I, I, I think the jury is still out on how, how much of a kind of a long-term phenomenon is happening in, in terms of Trump. In terms of Brexit, again, I don't have the answer, but. But to me, it, it also comes down to the question, a little bit of the, the, the education question, that if we're, if we're teaching people that you want to go out into life and want to connect and want to like, reach across borders and you will be a bigger, smarter, wider person, not wider in the <laughs> weight gain kind of way, uh, although if you savor the cuisines of Europe, you might become wider, but, um, but you, know, you will have a more kind of nuanced and, and richer experience of life by diversifying your influences and your connections, um, not by building walls. Um, that if that is something that we teach as part of this civics decision-making class when you're 15 or 16, you know, we might not, not have things like Brexit. Um, anyway, that's my we best shot at it. We are basically out of time, but I think we can squeeze in this one last question, because uh, I did promise it. It so. can only be one word long. <laughs> the answer can only be one word as well. <laughs> that I can do. <laughs> um, so, so we talked about pre-mortem um, as the last step that once we've decided that um, we look at the absolute worst case. My question is, do we look at the best case? And if we do, will that make us biased towards that decision? Yeah, so I kind of skipped over. Um, there, there is a kind of a third phase of actually making the decision where like, you've got all these alternatives. What you may have noticed is we, I didn't actually talk about the point at which you, like, you've identified these four things as potential paths. How do you choose which one to go? Um, and so in the book, I talk about that. There are a bunch of kind of cool techniques for, um, that in a sense are like the pros and cons list, but that are much more nuanced, right? The problem with the pros and cons list is it really only works for one person who's got their values that they're kind of listing down. And it only works for a whether or not decision, basically. It's really hard. It, it doesn't scale to a decision where there are four different rival alternatives. Um, and so I didn't want to just, it's a little bit nerdy 
and I didn't want to dive into it here, but in the book I talk, there's a technique called a value model or a linear value model um, where basically you, uh, like in a pros and cons list, you write down a list of, uh, of values that are important to you. Um, and then you give each of those values a weight for how important it is to you. Like having children is more important than clever conversation of men in clubs, presumably. Maybe not for all of you. Um, and so, and then you basically, for all the alternatives you're looking at, you give each one of them a score for each of those values. And then you basically multiply the weight times the score, and the one with the highest number kind of is the winner. It's a, it's a much more, it's a kind of an algorithmic way of looking at a decision. And it's not necessarily, there, there are definitely some choices in life. I wouldn't recommend deciding to marry based on, on, on this. Like, honey, I developed this spreadsheet here that shows <laughs> that you're, you're my mate over these three other rivals. That doesn't work very well, I should promise you. Um, but in terms of complex choices, it's a really good way to just kind of see it, to visualize it, because they are so multivariable. It's hard to kind of keep track of all those different things. And, and as a kind of sketch of basically what the options are and what the, the, how they map onto your values, it's, it's a good way to kind of get to that decision. Um, and then, yeah, when you're telling the story of the best case scenario, yes, that does tend to kind of bias you towards that solution. But that's why you want to tell multiple scenarios. You don't want to just tell that one. You want to th think about how it could fail or how it could get weird, like how it could surprise you in some way as well. All right. Thank you Thanks. very much for a really fascinating thing. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all very much for joining us online and here. Uh, if you're online, uh, goodbye. I hope we'll see you at other events here or virtually. If you're here in the room, I hope you'll come and join us. So we're going across to the Roost Bar, which is just through this way on the other side of the court, where there are a number of wonderful things. Steve will be there with, with books, which event. you can buy, you can talk to him, you can uh, get him to sign the book, you can ask for advice about that second child. <laughs> there is also a fantastic range of drinks available, including our own JPA, which is brewed just below the bar. So if you care about food miles, that's a pint you have to have. Thank you very much. See you at other events. Yeah, good, good. Okay.